to be okay. Good. All right, this is a big space, um, so we need to work to fill it a little bit. And it's nice that we can be together after, after so many months of being in our little spaces. Um, I think it's great if we can try to warm the space, try to warm our thinking, try to remember why we take care of people, why we work with people. And I just want to say I'm, I'm very excited um, to share with you what I hope will be a, an exploration for thinking and feeling. And don't worry too much about looking at the slides. There are seven or eight clinical studies that we'll look at. But I'm much more interested in you feeling a process, which is different than what you usually get at medical education conferences, in my experience. <laughs> uh, we want to try and fill you up so that you're a little bit chubby and round and happy and optimistic about what it means to take care of people um, and maybe get some new insights in that process. And I want to say personally that my background is in family medicine. Um, when I finished training, I worked for a while at a couple of medical schools teaching family medicine and then started learning this anthroposophic approach. And there's an interesting place that comes where um, a sort of new panorama opens and you start seeing things in a little bit of a different way. And, and it's beautiful and it can be a little bit sad because if the genie gets out of the bottle, it's hard to go back. And I think that probably everybody in this room has had multiple genies come out of bottles where you say, ooh, I need to do something in a, in a richer, in a more enlivened way. And I just want to share with you part of the tools that anthroposophic medicine has for expanding and enriching our care. So a good place to start is why even bother to look at a, another set of philosophies, at another set of paradigms. Right now in the world we are filled and kind of bombarded with so much information that I think it's easy to become wary of more information and what's kind of the, the motivation for it. Um, I think one is fragmentation of care, that it's, it's very easy right now to get stuck on specific aspects. And whatever is the lens that you're using, that's what you tend to use. But it can mean that patients feel that they are really limited in terms of just what is their diagnosis, or what is their lab result, or what is their imaging study. So we want to try and round that out. A second is what I will say is an external pressure to provide treatments that go faster. I haven't met many providers who themselves would say, I would love to do things in a 12-minute visit. Um, one trick is that when you have limited time, then you tend to go more protocol. Um, more protocols become the kind of driving force in your care. And protocols are great, but they're not everything. A loss of connection. I want to say to the natural world, how can we learn from the natural world? How have thousands of years of natural medicine um, evolved? And how can we still use that knowledge even with a modern medical view? How can we broaden our range of therapeutic tools? And then I want to bring in the element of provider burnout, which is getting very, very big. Um, there are some studies that say it's up over 50% of providers. And I think the burnout comes from some of the siloing or the fragmentation and the rush and the loss of connection. So together we want to see if we can build a more rounded picture of what it means to be a person. So there's one potential picture. Um, I kind of like this one. I don't know that I completely understand this one. But when I was looking for pictures of people, I said, well, 
there's the person in the middle, and it's dynamic, it's warm, feels like there's a lot happening there, it's kind of centered in the heart. So maybe that's one image we could think about. Would be kind of fun if you walked into an exam room and there was the patient looking like this. Uh, this is obviously an older version. I don't know if you can see it, but it says cholera and melancholia, sanguine. So this is a medieval text talking about um, temperaments and the humors. So that's another way of trying to look at things from multiple d dimensions, sort of multiple perspectives. And then this is a drawing uh, that's about 100 years old, that's used a lot in anthroposophic medicine. It has a lot of arrows. It looks dynamic. Don't worry about it too much, except that you can see that there are four colors. And we're going to use a fourfold approach for the first part of the morning to try to understand how we can develop this fuller image of people, of patients. So different pictures. Uh, anthroposophic medicine, really, it's very exciting. 2020 is the 100 year anniversary of anthroposophic medicine. It was founded in Central Europe. There have been big international celebrations. Uh, it's a little ironic that a celebration of an international movement happens in a pandemic year. So instead of there being one colossal central celebration, there have actually been different gatherings on multiple continents. I think we can consider this gathering part of that. But in 1920, Rudolf Steiner, who is um, the philosopher, the scientist, the writer, the educator who helped bring many of these ideas into practical action, he was talking to medical students. And as part of his talks, which are very intense, if I was a medical student, I think I would have been a little bit intimidated because he's really pushing buttons about why are you doing this? And do you really want to heal people? And he says things like, your will to heal people should so be so big that you just want to walk down the round, walk down the road and heal people who are already healthy. It should just be huge. I'm not sure that I would have known how to work with that as a second year medical student, but um, as part of his lectures, he says, you find a great gulf within you over which you must find the bridge. You must find the bridge from the medical scientific to the moral to the loving. You see, when I speak, for example, of what I call the warmth organization of the human being, for you it is initially an abstraction but you must find the bridge to experience this warmth, organization, in such a way that you find your way from the experience of the warmth differentiations of the individual organs to moral warmth. Would you have understood that as a medical student? Okay, well this is a preview of what we're gonna do this morning. We're, we're gonna build warmth bridges. He finishes what he's saying and with this sort of wrap up. You will have to experience what is called heart warmth in such a way that you will feel this warm heart right into the physical. You will have to find the way from the scientific physiological to the spiritual moral and from the spiritual moral to the physiological anatomical. So this is the book where this is described there's a nice picture of a bridge. I was looking for pictures of bridges and I found this and actually um, this is a city in southern Germany where I did a year of college and my dorm was in this building. Not in the tower, but in this 600 year old building. So I just had to throw that in because it's a beautiful picture. So, how do we usually think about warmth? 
at this moment. Stephen already mentioned it. Is your t what is your temperature? You might be wondering, is it safe to be in the room with this man? 99.3, oh, borderline. Kind of revved up while I'm talking. But um, we're thinking a lot about temperature and is it safe, right? Which is appropriate, it's a good tool. And we think about what kind of temperature is most accurate. Does this little thing do a good job? And one interesting question is, do we know what a healthy temperature is? Looks very safe way there to take the temperature. So I'd like us to go on a warm journey. And um, to start, while socially distanced, physically distanced, I'd like you to um, just take your hands and see if you can feel where it gets a little bit warm. Some people, in the morning, they wake up, you know, and whoop, their, <laughs> their warmth is big. Sometimes I wake up and it takes a while for my hands to warm. So just... Yeah, it's sort of there for me today. It's kind of interesting. You could you can try it different places. If we could be closer together, it's fun to take another person and feel their warmth. Sometimes even from behind. So there's a temperature, a measurement that's warmth, but there are also different ways that we can feel warmth. Um, as part of anthroposophic practices, there's a movement therapy called eurythmy. And one of the movement, try this, goes like this where you bring one hand back and there's a kind of streaming. This is a, a really nice way to build some warmth. And sometimes when your hands get closed, you can, whoop, yeah, I just, there's a little warmth there. And actually, if we, if we did this exercise, you can do it both hands together. This is a really good way to build warmth, actually. So that, that could feel a little wavy gravy, but, but I think it's something perceptible, right? <laughs> it's dynamic. And it might be one way today, and it might be one way at noon, and it might be a different way tomorrow. So let's start our warmth journey. Um, this is a study that came out last January. You might have heard about it in the news. Decreasing human body temperature in the United States since the Industrial Revolution. Did anybody see that or hear about it? And it was NPR and it, it, made the, it made the news for a little bit. So published January 7th. And what was very interesting is they found three different cohorts of people. One was the Union Army veterans of the Civil War who were cared for from 1860 to 1940. So 80 years of measurements for this cohort. And that's what you see here in the top curve, which if you come down, it's roughly around 98.5, 98.6. Then they had the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES, in the early 70s. Big population study. We've got more data points. We get a better curve. And then uh, 2007 to 2017, the Stanford Translational Research Integrated Database Environmental Cohort, STRIDE, and they had a lot of people in their cohort, so they have a very nice bell-shaped curve of temperature. And what they noticed is that these curves are offset. Now, when this study came out, there were a lot of questions about it. And one was saying, gosh, um, what is the data, and how did they measure it? 
because maybe our thermometers are better. Or maybe thermometers have just changed. So an important point is to say, is it a reliable measure? Did they use good tools? And fortunately, if I remember the details correctly, they had some of these thermometers. You know, so they could sort of look. They were mercury thermometers, old, old thermometers. So they could look and say, oh, the way it's scaled, it still measures correctly today compared to what we would expect. So the tools are pretty good, because that's a first really important part. Can we trust old measures and knowledge? Did they have good medical knowledge? Did they have good technique? Um, were they consistent in the way that they did their measurements? You know, when we look at that wheel with the four humors on it, it's a little bit easy to be kind of cynical and say, well, that was pretty old knowledge. They didn't really know what they were doing. And we know a lot more now. So a lot of questions about this study was saying, well, how did they do all of these things? And then how many times did people look? What was the statistical significance? So um, this is temperature trends within the birth cohorts. And what they looked at was birth decade. This is for that first Civil War cohort. And what they found is that people born in the 1820s, that's the kind of turquoise line, as they lived to be older, they measured up to 80, their body temperature slowly decreased. And that's not unusual because we know that body temperature does change. If you have a fever of 102 in an 18 month old, not such a big deal. If you have a fever of 102 in an 80 year old, big deal probably. Um, 1930s, if that was their birth decade, similar trend, but it went lower. 1840s, had a long measurement. These people lived a long time, so they've got decades of measurement and a big decrease. So there's something about being born a little bit later that body temperature got lower. And I think this, is, this doesn't quite fit our normal thinking. And that's why people said, did they have good thermometers? Did they know what they were doing? This doesn't quite, might, quite make sense. Um, they looked then at uh, curves for men and women in both white patients and black patients. And what they found is that year of birth, so again, we're looking at um, birth years or birth decades, is that as people were born later for men and for women, both white patients and black patients, that the temperature goes down. So we could almost say a risk factor for having a lower body temperature is being born later. Then they looked at um, controlling for the time of day. Pretty thorough analysis. This is year of birth. So again, we're looking at cohorts over time. They brought all of the data together. And for both male patients and female patients, women having uh, an on average a slightly elevated body temperature compared to men, that there was also this decline. And this is interesting that they looked at time of day. Why would that matter? Any idea? So this is a, a more recent study. This is 2016. Um, called diurnal and circadian variation of sleep and alertness in men versus naturally cycling women. And we know from ovulation that there's a rise in body temperature. That might be part of why those curves that we saw before were different, that women are on average a little bit warmer than men. And so this is a scale of sleepiness versus alertness, which over 24 hours goes up and down. That makes good sense. And then they looked at melatonin production, which we'd also expect to go up and down. 
And then they got to body temperature, which also fluctuates in these sinusoidal curves. So it makes a big difference as to whether you are measuring at peak temperature versus base temperature, about a sixth of a degree Celsius, pretty significant. So if in the 1860s everybody was measuring temperatures uh, in the late afternoon because that was their nursing protocol, that could throw off the study. Um, but what I wanna say is there are ways that we can look at warmth which are just factual, and then there are ways that we can start to look at warmth which are dynamic. And just by difference of birth decade, 1820s, 30s, 40s, we see that the temperature is different. And when they looked at this cumulative data, it's a little bit like rings in a tree, that it changes each time, that for every decade later a person was born, their average temperature was about 0 0.01 degrees Celsius lower. So if in the 1860s the average body temperature was 98.6, the average body temperature now is about 97.9. I was never taught that in medical training. But I think if you measure temperatures in people regularly, you notice that most people are not 98.6. And sometimes you see 96, or occasionally even 95, but 97 is quite common. So just this little bit of, huh, okay, temperature moves. Here's a nice, somebody just put a beautiful pebble into the water, we've got nice circles. And just thinking about this dynamic quality of how warmth changes, not just over decades, but over the course of the day. So what significance does this have? Um, this is an older measurement, but done very beautifully, very precisely. Uh, this says in German, uh, regular mild abdominal typhus. So fairly standard, but a beautiful fever curve. Twice day measurements, seeing tremendous variation from day to day over the course of the illness. And that actually, if you are measuring always at the lower part versus the upper part, you're gonna have probably a different clinical picture. Just to show here with um, the peak of the illness, the temperatures were getting up to almost 106. We don't let that happen very much but 106 to 103 and a half, pretty big difference. Okay, so now I wanna take a leap into why this is clinically practical. It, it's not just fun to think about. This is um, an average fever curve for an acute illness, where we can see we've got some variation. This is measured in hours, it doesn't say an exact scale but we would expect there's some variation. And then there's going to be shivering and vasoconstriction as the fever rises. This is when people really are uncomfortable. Achy, maybe right in here is where you start to say, ooh, I think I'm starting to come down with something. My appetite is off, um, or I have strange cravings, my body hurts. And then our body reaches its goal, its peak temperature, and maintains that for some time and then we go into a process of warmth release, of sweating and vasodilatation. So that's not so unexpected. Now if we take this same curve and think about it dynamically, then we would say, oh, what is the body trying to do? It is needing to build warmth. That's its whole goal. And this is not the illness, this is the immune system building warmth, right? We need later on to move to release warmth. Once the body has achieved that maximal warmth state, at a certain point it says, that's enough. And that's when you get so hot 
and you want the covers off. But if you put somebody in an ice bath at this point, you're actually retarding the process and working against what's trying to be naturally achieved. And here, it's appropriate to actually let somebody release some warmth. So we can think about building or supporting warmth in the early part of an illness and releasing it at the appropriate time. And when we work with these dynamic components, they really become our friends. I have to say, I think this will really make you excited about fevers. <laughs> so you go, oh, there's something good happening here. I don't just, I have to be thoughtful, and I have to look at it as an important marker, but I don't have to get locked into it in terms of fear. So, what if we work to better understand the dynamics of growth and change, and if we start thinking not just about a single measurement, but about time? This is a study from 2014, an anthroposophic study of acute respiratory illnesses and ear infections. So this, this is an interesting curve. We can see days of illness, and they've got diamonds for the anthroposophic treatment and little pyramids for conventional treatment. And what this graph is measuring is time to first improvement. So um, let's see here. Day one, about 40% of patients being treated anthroposophically felt an improvement. Day one for conventional treatment, let's, maybe that's 22%. Uh, what's interesting is that when you try to get up here towards 100, this is about day number four, looks like, for the anthroposophic treatment, and to get that level of conventional treatment is about day number six. There are a lot of things like um, antiviral treatment for flu that are finding or working to create similar changes in faster resolution of symptoms. So this is a kind of measure that we would work towards. And you say, well, that's nice, okay. This is what's juicy. <laughs> this is um, comparison to other studies in terms of antibiotic prescription rates. And we've got cough and bronchitis, sore throat pharyngitis, ear pain otitis, and upper respiratory tract as a general diagnosis. And look at the antibiotic prescription rates. We've got close to 70%, mid-50s, 20% anthroposophic treatment in the single digits. Sore throat pharyngitis, single. All of these, you can see there's a very similar change in terms of people are actually feeling slightly better sooner, and the amount of antibiotics that have to be prescribed is a fraction of conventional treatment. I really think if we can mix up our medical paradigms a little bit, that if you could package this in a medicine and advertise it, it would be huge. These are big statistical differences. And antibiotic resistance is a big problem. Part of what was being worked with is recognition that when the fever is rising, you don't interfere in that process. You can Modulate the fever, you want to make sure that somebody is safe, but you're not working to completely suppress that inflammatory response. There are other aspects too. <laughs> There's a lot of herbal treatment. There are ki different kinds of external treatments of compresses and oils and ointments. Um, but I would say an important part of working with acute illnesses is this recognition of the dynamics of warmth and fever. What does anthroposophic actually mean? It is not a very sexy marketing term. But it's an important word. <laughs> it's important because anthropos means the human being. And Sophia means wisdom. This is a striving for, we could say, into the true nature or the whole nature of the human being. Anthroposophic or anthroposophic ideas or anthroposophy are the same knowledge and insight that stand behind anthroposophic medicine, 
Waldorf Education, Steiner Schools, if you've heard of those, and Biodynamic Agriculture. So it's something that's been brought into multiple areas of life. And anthroposophic medicine itself is practiced in about 60 countries. And I have a very happy job that I work um, on the board of an organization, the Anthroposophic Health Association, where we've got practitioners of medicine, nursing, uh, body therapies, arts therapies, movement therapies, all trying to see how do we work in parallel ways together to build this bigger picture. So I want to just quickly review. What step did we take in there? Because it was a little bit slippery maybe, but I hope it wasn't too strange. Um, there are facts. What is your specific temperature measurement? And then there's flow. We could probably think of better words, but these are the good ones I have today. We could think about what is the temperature versus when is the temperature. Specific measurement versus patterns of change. Anatomy versus fluid. So now we're just making the concept bigger. It's not just about fixed structures, it's about flowing structures. This is the Greek physician Asclepius caring for a patient. And the Greeks talked about this kind of differentiated approach in terms of earth, water, air, and fire. So I think they, have, they were on to something. Um, and within anthroposophic medicine, the terms that are used for these four levels are physical, etheric, astral, and eye. Probably unfamiliar terms, but they're very specific descriptions of different ways of seeing. Um, the second level of flow is usually described as the etheric organization for a human being. And where um, the physical body or the structure is about facts, time and flow are related to each other. This we had on the last slide. There's that anthroposophic word again. And then we could say, well, how can I really observe this? And say, well, if you look at a mineral, at a stone, it has testable components, um, it has a structure, it has physical mass. If we look at the plant world, we start to th see things change in time. And we see processes of growing and dying. And if you're looking at a person and you're trying to understand the difference between these two, you can look at a corpse and you can look at someone deeply asleep and obviously there's a difference. This will make more sense when we go just a little bit further. But there's something, but even someone who's in a coma, who's not responding to you in any way, there's something different between a person in a coma and a person who has died. And that's this level of the etheric of growth forces, of formative life forces. The Greeks spoke about this aspect as the Archaeus. I am not an expert in traditional Chinese medicine, but from my perspective, from an anthroposophic side, there is much overlap between an understanding of qi and the etheric. And I think if we looked at many different traditional healing streams, we would find different words and different descriptions for the same process. Anthroposophic medicine is trying to bring that perspective and unite it with modern medical knowledge. Okay. So my question is, what are other places where we can watch dynamics of time and change? And what does this add to our clinical approach? And so that you don't become too mineralized, and we're 50 minutes in, if you'd like to stretch for a moment before we go to part two, and just think, are, are there any clinical areas where you can see this differentiation from strict factual measurement to flow and dynamic? 
or if you had a different burning question. Good, okay. We'll have more time for questions. <laughs> or did you have something? Nope, okay, good. Then we'll take our next step. Part two. You didn't know you were gonna get a three-part introduction, did you? <laughs> so we still wanna look at fourfold clinical insights, but we're gonna look at the next two levels. <laughs> 